All right, well, good morning, everybody, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. It really is lovely to be here. So what I thought I'd do, I thought I'd start off by speaking a little bit about what I'm going to cover in the next 45 minutes or so. With a title like this, some of you might be a bit worried as to how long this is actually going to take, um, especially when it comes to TLS. There's so much that can be discussed, but don't worry. I'll fill one speaking slot, and then we can get on with the rest of the day discussing TLS. So I thought it would be nice to position some of the work that I've done within the broader realm of attacks against TLS. Now, this has definitely been an area that has been heating up significantly over the past several years, and there have been some really nice techniques that have come to the fore in recent times. So the purpose of this talk, really, is to give you an overview of TLS and its attack history, um, and at some point I will dive into details about some of the work that I have been involved in. Um, it's, so hopefully the talk will get you up to speed on TLS if you need it, but it will also make you aware of some of the key attacks against TLS that you really should know about. I will state now that I'm not going to be talking too much about TLS 1.3 in this talk. So a lot of what I'm going to say now pertains to TLS 1.2 and below. Um, TLS 1.3 is currently under development and hopefully we'll have a publicly released specification soon, uh, but we don't know. But if you've checked the program, you'll see that I'll be talking about TLS 1.3 later on in the day, so I'm going to leave those details until then. Right, so if we think about this as our attack timeline, our currently very sparsely populated attack timeline, I'm going to consider everything that happened before 2011 as the past. And because this is my talk, I can do that. Uh, I can dictate how we label time. Um, I'm going to think about everything that happened between 2011 and now as the present, and then perhaps, unsurprisingly, I'll treat the future as starting from tomorrow. Right. Uh, before we start off on this TLS attack adventure, though, um, I'll go through a bit of background and just run through what TLS is. Then I'll kind of talk about what was going on in the protocol prior to 2011. Uh, and then I'll talk about what was happening between 2011 and now, and this is where I'll talk about some of the work that I've done, and specifically um, password recovery attacks against RC4 in TLS. And then we'll wrap up by briefly thinking about where, they are, where the protocol is going and what TLS 1.3 might look like, but like I've said, I'll really cover more of that in my second talk. Okay, so there you have it, past, present, future. Okay, so before we kind of get into the attack timeline and all the attacks against TLS, let's think about what TLS actually is. And this is a slide that I stole from my supervisor, Kenny Patterson. Um, it's from a talk that I saw, or a lecture, that I sometimes give on his behalf. And we use it to convince students of the all-pervasive nature of TLS. Um, TLS is used by millions, if not billions, of users on a daily basis. Uh, and broadly speaking, the goal of TLS is to establish a secure channel between communicating entities. Now, TLS was originally designed for the purposes of e-commerce, but it's now used far more widely. Um, so if you think about online banking, or when you access your Gmail or your Facebook account, you'll be using TLS. Okay, um, so if you think about this, this is our... Um, our network protocol model, this is the TCP IP model, and TLS is a network protocol that is intended to provide security services for the application layer. So you can think about TLS as being sandwiched between the application layer and the transport layer. So TLS will run over something like TCP, and HTTP will run over TLS, and this gives you HTTPS. TLS is largely made up of two sub-protocols, mainly the handshake protocol and the record protocol. Now, the handshake protocol uses public key cryptography to authenticate the communicating entities and to help establish keys that are going to be used to protect application data as part of the record protocol. And then the record protocol itself makes use of these keys to provide confidentiality and authenticity of application data. This is a very high-level view of what's going on. It's a, a very kind of rough diagram, maybe. And um, there are actually quite a lot of message flights that are being exchanged here. And how I've represented it is I've represented it as the handshake protocol and the record protocol overlapping slightly. In the case of TLS 1.2 and below, this is definitely true because the, fi the first record to be protected by the record protocol is the final 
um, message of the handshake protocol a finished message. So in essence, the handshake protocol is really running over the record protocol. Okay, so who are the major players in this TLS ecosystem? So for someone like me, a researcher, it's sometimes very easy to think about TLS just as a protocol that I can look at in an abstract way and maybe analyze it, but I really do think we need an appreciation for the fact that the TLS ecosystem has become very complex and has become very, very vibrant. Uh, we have servers of all shapes and sizes that need to deliver content. Uh, we again have clients of varying shapes and sizes. And if you think about opening a browser on your phone, that browser acts as a client wishing to connect to a server. We also have certification authorities, right? That they are responsible for the issuance of trusted digital certificates. We have software vendors. So Google, Google develops Chrome, and Chrome will need to know how to speak TLS. So there needs to be a, a TLS implementation, a software implementation of TLS. There are also hardware vendors like companies like Cisco and Intel that produce networking devices. Um, there's the IETF, which stands for the Internet Engineering Task Force, and this is the standards body responsible for maintaining the TLS standards. And it's also nice to appreciate that there are many different TLS versions that we use kind of concurrently. There are countless extensions to TLS, and an extension kind of adds functionality or will patch the protocol in some way. And we can also kind of, there are over 200 cipher suites that can be negotiated. Um, so there's a lot going on in the protocol. And then, of course, there's a group of people like me who are researchers, and we try and figure out how this protocol actually works, what's happening, we try to analyze it, and we try and think about how these, how these actors actually relate to each other. Um, now, in this diagram, the arrows should probably be bi-directional, uh, but at times my image creation skills are somewhat limited. But um, if you really think about it, all of these actors are really interacting with each other. Okay. So now that we know a little bit about how TLS works, kind of let's delve into our timeline. So TLS started life as SSL, which stands for Secure Sockets Layer, and this was developed by Netscape. Um, SSL version 1 was flawed at birth and was never really publicly released. Then we get SSL version 2, which was released in 1995, but because of security flaws, that was quickly superseded by SSL version 3 in 1996. Then in 1999, the IETF kind of came along and they decided they wanted to standardize a version of TLS, oh, of SSL, sorry, and they called it TLS, which stands for Transport Layer Security. Something I probably should have mentioned much earlier, but I'm sure you all know that. Um, TLS 1.0 was not dramatically different from SSL version 3, but there were enough differences to preclude interoperability between the two protocols. Um, then in 2006, we see TLS 1.1 comes along, and this had a few new features and patched a few, or had a few security enhancements. And in 2008, we see TLS 1.2, and this now had more support, and it had support specifically for authenticated encryption, it had better AES support, and that sort of thing. So that's very briefly the evolutionary timeline of TLS. Now in this era, I'm only going to really highlight two attacks. Um, in 1998, we had the Blackenbacher attack, and this was against RSA when PKCS, the PKCS version 1, or number 1, encoding was used for encryption. And SSL version 3 was susceptible to this attack, to this um, plain text recovery attack. Then in 2009, Ray and Dispenser came along and they published the renegotiation attack. And this exploited a very particular type of TLS handshake known as the renegotiation handshake. Right, so if we populate our timeline a little bit, it looks like this. But there was actually a little bit more going on, and the timeline really looks like that. There, were other, there was other work and other analyses that I really haven't touched on. Right, okay, so I've included this slide to give you a, an appreciation for the fact that all of these versions that I've just been talking about of SSL and TLS are currently being used kind of um, concurrently, really, um, as part of this ecosystem. And this was according to SSL Pulse. And you can see that TLS version 1 is kind of still the most popular. Right, uh, so moving swiftly into the present. Um, and we're going to see an explosion of attacks against TLS. 
And in 20, 2011, um, Duang and Rizzo published the Beast attack. Now, this was an attack that targeted SSL version 3 and TLS 1.0. And it attacked CBC encryption. And what the attack did, it actually introduced a few really nice techniques for attacking TLS. And we actually make use of those techniques in our attacks. And you'll see that a little bit later. Then in 2012, the same authors published the crime attack. And crime exploited the way compression happened in TLS. So it pretty much made use of a compression side channel to recover plain text. It's not really since the double menace of beast and crime that we see a highly concentrated effort by the academic community to start analyzing TLS and to start breaking it. In 2013, we see the very clever Lucky 13 attack by Alphadon and Patterson. And this was a timing attack against TLS. Um, it made use of a timing side channel to kind of um, re-enable a padding oracle that could be used to recover plain text. Uh, and then in that same year, we see um, the RC4 attacks against TLS by Alpha Dan et al. And what they were doing is they were targeting cookies in TLS when RC4 was used as the main method of encryption. And in 2014, we see the cookie cutter and the triple handshake attack by um, Barkovan et al. The first one obviously targets cookies, and the second one breaks authentication in TLS. And then we can't forget the kind of widely publicized heartbeat plug. This was an implementation bug um, in the OpenSSL library, and it allowed for the dumping or the reading of private keys. And then towards the end of 2014, we see Poodle. Poodle allowed for a downgrade to SSL version 3, and then a, a padding oracle and a vulnerability could be exploited in SSL version 3. Okay, so our timeline kind of now looks like this. Uh, I've given you a bit of a whirlwind tour through the attacks so far, and I haven't been completely forthcoming because there are a few things that I've left out. So the timeline actually looks like this. Right, so now I get to zoom in and talk a little bit about work that I was involved in. And we specifically tried to recover passwords when they were protected by RC4 in TLS. And why did we decide to do this? Well, besides there being like kind of very high profile attacks against RC4 in TLS, like this paper over here, which was at Usenix 2013, usage of the stream cipher still stood about 34% in December of 2014. And this is when we're really starting to think, think about the work. We started thinking about it just a bit before then. But the usage of RC4 was really, really high, despite the fact that there was this kind of high profile attack. And we thought that the main reason for this is that the attacks by Alpha Dun et al. were not of great enough practical significance to bring RC4 to the point where it needed to be abandoned by practitioners. Um, so the question what we wanted to ask ourselves was, well, can we do better? And we wanted to target passwords because they're widely used for authentication on the web, and passwords are not uniformly distributed. And maybe using, using that fact, we could come up with attacks that could boost the old attacks, and we could come up with attacks that were far more practical. And we would get RC4 closer to the point where it would start to be abandoned. OK, um, because I'm talking about RC4, I should probably introduce it. So RC4 is a stream cipher designed by Ron Rivest in 1987. Its details were kept secret uh, for quite a while until it was leaked, a description of the algorithm was leaked on the internet in 1994. RC4 is very simple. It has a very elegant structure. This is it. It's basically just a couple of lines of code. Um, and RC4 is made up of two parts, the key scheduling algorithm and the key generation algorithm. The details of this are not really that important, but what we should care about is that the key, key stream generation algorithm spits out a byte, and this byte gets XORed with some plain text, and that produces a ciphertext byte. Right. <clears throat> so how is RC4 used in TLS? Well, if you return to our high-level um, diagram, we see that RC4 has been negotiated as the cipher of choice for protecting application data. Two RC4 keys are established, right? one for upstream traffic and one for downstream traffic. And like I said before, RC4 is an additive stream cipher, so a byte of ciphertext is created by XORing a byte of plain text with a key stream byte over there. All right, something else, or maybe two things to note, is that the RC4 keys are 128 bits in length, 
And the first record to be protected by RC4 are the first 36 bytes of a finished message. This is important for our attacks because in each connection, this value is mutable. It changes with each connection. So it actually means that we cannot target this value in our attacks. Okay, so on the surface, RC4 seems like a really nice choice. It's really simple, it's fast, and it's really good for legacy implementations. But RC4 has a bias to Keystream. It has some sort of what we think of as a fingerprint. And what does that mean? Well, that means that certain Keystream bytes appear more or less often than they should. Now, if RC4 was a good stream cipher, if its Keystream looks pseudo-random, in these diagrams over here, you're looking at single bytes, um, the biases or the probability for single bytes. You should be seeing a straight line at 2 to the minus 8 in all of those graphs, right? But RC4 is not a good stream cipher, and we definitely see biases, particularly this is for position 2, a really strong bias towards the value 0 in that position. Also, when you think about adjacent bytes, so these are bytes that are directly adjacent to each other, we also call them double bytes, for a good stream cipher, you'd be seeing hardly any color on these heat maps, but you're seeing definite biases happening over here. All right, um, so as an attacker, how does this kind of, how, how does this fingerprint help me? Well, in 2001, Manton and Shamir described an attack against RC4, uh, known as the broadcast attack. Um, it was a cipher text only attack and uh, used to recover plain text. And what the attack needed was a fixed plain text P to be encrypted multiple times under independent RC4 keys. Right? So that's an important fact to keep note of. And what they did is they discovered this bias over here and they made use of that to recover the second byte of encrypted, um, well, the second byte of, to attack the second byte of ciphertext and recover the plain text byte. When they describe the attack, they have a setting where they kind of describe one user sending the same email to multiple recipients, having shared a different key with each of them. In the TLS setting, though, we're in a different case. Uh, we have one client and one server sending one secret, and we need the secret to be sent repeatedly from one client to one server, but again, making use of fresh and independent RC4 keys. Okay, so the attack described by Manson and Shamir wasn't entirely optimal. What you really want to make use of is an optimal Bayesian procedure. So for a candidate plain text byte, x, what you want to maximize is this, the probability that x takes on a particular value given a set of ciphertexts over there. Where this is maximal, you pretty much deem to have your correct plain text byte. By Bayes' theorem, if we now kind of unpack this expression over here, we end up with something like this. But if you notice on the denominator, this, this is going to stay constant for each of the values x, or x prime in this case. Right? So we can actually ignore this denominator going forward when we consider our calculations. And that's kind of exactly what we do. All right. So what we actually want to maximize is this thing over here. But what is this really? Right? This is just this, and this term relates to the a priori plaintext distribution. So it's the probability that x will take on a particular value. Right? And this, well, this is really just the probability that I see a particular vector of keystream bytes. And this, what this is really, is a measure of how well an induced distribution on the keystream bytes matches the known distribution. And when you're at a point when your induced distribution is a close match to your known distribution, you're in a good position, and you probably have the correct plain text byte. OK, so people who don't like Bayesian equations, um, I've tried to encapsulate all of this in a diagram. So for a fixed plain, for um, a byte r, what we do is for a candidate plain text byte x, we XOR this value with the relevant byte in the ciphertext. So these are our, our kind of independent ciphertexts, our S independent ciphertexts. So what this is, it yields an induced distribution on the keystream. Now what we want to do is we want to match this to the known distribution because we know that RC4 has a particular distribution that its keystream does. Then what we do is we combine this with our a priori plaintext information and this spits out an a posteriori likelihood 
of x being the correct byte. And where this is maximal, right, we deem to have the correct plain text byte. So in their work, Alphaline et al. wanted to target cookies using this procedure. And they did exactly this, but they implicitly assumed that the a priori distribution was uniform. And maybe for cookies, that's actually not such an unreasonable assumption. Uh, so what they did is they built up a detailed picture of the distribution of the RC4 keystream bytes in the first 256 positions. And the reason they wanted to look there is because that's where the biases are the most interesting. Um, they, they, were, they found some known biases, or they confirmed some known biases, and they also found some new ones. But, unfortunately for them, a cookie is not really encrypted in the first 256 positions, right? In those first 256 bytes. So although you have these lovely RC4 biases, you can't really use them. So what they had to do is they had to use a different set of biases known as the fluor mcgrew biases, and these are for double bytes. And this is a bias that kind of periodically repeats in the RC4 keystream. Now that attack needed two to the 34 encryptions, which is kind of not great, it's a bit high. And it also, it generated large volumes of network traffic and needed about 2,000 hours of wall clock time to complete. So it wasn't really practically significant. So the question was, well, can we do better by looking at passwords? Um, and like I said, we wanted to attack passwords because they are widely used for authentication. And we know that passwords are not uniformly distributed. And maybe making use of this a priori distribution information would help boost our attacks so we can come up with something more practical. So we know that users routinely choose bad passwords, with passwords like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 currently being counted as the most popular right, in leaked data sets. And another thing is, because they are leaked data sets, we can use those for our a priori distribution information. And that's exactly what we do in our attacks. Another thing we wanted to do was to kind of reframe the problem. Instead of thinking about recovering one byte, we now wanted to cover several bytes of an RC4, or of a password, at least, so se several characters of a password. So we started thinking in the multi-byte framework instead of just single bytes. So again, we wanted to maximize this. <coughs> But now x is a, an n-character password, and this now is the probability that I observe a particular matrix of keystream bytes, right? But we have a bit of a problem, because how do I actually determine this? This is for n bytes of the RC4 keystream. I have information for single bytes in the RC4 keystream, and I have information for double bytes in the RC4 keystream. But even computing the double byte um, bias information Took, it took us about nine days, um, and it was computationally quite intensive. I think we used about 512 cores to do that. So if you want to think about doing this for more than two bytes, for n bytes, it really is computationally prohibitive. So we have a problem with kind of coming up with this term. So what we did is we used approximations, and we attacked it via two avenues. And we thought, OK, well, let's assume that all keystream bytes behave independently, right? So we can just really use a product distribution, or we can assume that a keystream byte is really only affected by the byte directly adjacent to it. And this allows us to use our known double byte probabilities together with our known single byte probabilities. So we approximate this difficult term for us, which is for n bytes, kind of using the bias information that we know. OK, again, this is it in um, um, pictorial format. <laughs> Here again are our S-independent ciphertexts. Uh, and now we're looking at n bytes and not one. We take a candidate password and we XOR this with the relevant portion of the ciphertext. This yields an induced distribution on n bytes of the keystream. I want to try and match that to the known distribution. I don't have the known distribution, so I come up with an approximation for this measure. I combine this with the a priori password information and this spits out an a posteriori likelihood of x being the correct password. All right, now something that I've kind of glossed over here, or been guilty of glossing over, is the fact that we don't run through each possible password candidate. I mean, there would be too many. So what we do is we have a dictionary of n possible passwords for which we have the associated a priori distribution information. And we get that from leaked password data sets. So maybe this is actually a good point yeah, to, pull, to point out what's different between our attack and um, the attack by Alphadine et al. 
We now are looking at n bytes instead of just one. Also, in the password setting, if you think about entering your password, there's this factor called the rate limiting factor that we need to account for. So that, you know, when you, when you enter a password, you have a certain number of attempts before you're locked out of account. So we had to think about that as well. Uh, we used a dictionary of size n. We also had a choice of, well, do we use our single byte estimator or do we use our double byte estimator? Again, we needed S independent ciphertext. And something that was very important for us to think about was password guessing attacks. Because these exist. There are optimal password guessing attacks where an attacker will just run through, you know, the most, um, the most likely, starting with the most likely password and just try and guess. And if we didn't beat optimal, oh, sorry, if we didn't beat guessing attacks, then, you know, why were we doing the work? Okay, so we ran simulations to kind of gauge the performance of our attacks. And uh, we used a dictionary built from the Rock U leak. And we attacked a singles.org, uh, this was a dating site, and they had a password leak as well. So we'd sample a password from this data set, and we'd use the Rock U leak as our dictionary in our attack. Now, of course, this means that we weren't always going to, we were never going to achieve 100% um, a success rate because there are going to be passwords in the singles.org data set, passwords that are likely sample, that are not going to be in my attack dictionary. So I won't even consider them in my attack. So it limits our attack, but it's actually more realistic because in practice, you're not really going to know the true distribution of the, or the true password distribution. Okay, these were our parameters. We looked at a password of length six. This was our rate limiting factor, and we tried for various numbers of ciphertexts that you collect of the password. All right, and we did 256 experiments um, for each simulation. So this is what we saw. Uh, this is a graph depicting our single byte versus our double byte estimator. Uh, as you can see, we do pretty well early on. Again, this is because we see really nice biases in the early positions of the RC4 key stream. Um, Something that you might notice, though, is, okay, we are capped at about 80%, but that's for the reason that I explained. There are going to be some passwords that we're just never going to hit because we're using a different data set for selection and a different data set for attacking. What's also quite interesting when we noticed when we saw these results, uh, it's probably something we should have thought about theoretically first, to be honest, but is that the single byte and the double byte attacks were kind of similar. Uh, and the reason for this is, that there are not many double byte probabilities or double byte biases in those first um, 256 positions that are not as a result of the strong single byte biases in those 256 positions. So that means that our attacks, our attacks are effectively pretty similar. Okay, guessing. Like I said, do we beat guessing? Um, a very important question for our work to answer. And how we did this is that we looked at a, a well-known password guessing metric in the literature, and what it does, it relates, or it, it estimates or measures the number of guesses you need to break a certain proportion of accounts, right? So that's what I've got on my, my y-axis, is the number of guesses in log form, and this is effectively the number of accounts that I can break with those guesses. So where you really want to be on this graph is you want the number of guesses to be low, but you want your recovery rate to be high. So you really want to be down here, bottom right. Now this black line over here, I don't know if you can see it. So this is our optimal guessing curve. So this is where we used absolutely no information from ciphertexts whatsoever. So this was just running through a dictionary, starting with the most popular password um, and going to the end most popular password and trying to guess um, the password. And you can see from about 2 to the 22 onwards, we actually beat optimal guessing and kind of for high numbers of ciphertext, 2 to 28, we're actually doing pretty well. Right, so um, our attacks were kind of applicable to two application layer protocols, uh, basic auth and IMAP. And what I'm going to talk about now is really just uh, basic auth. I won't touch on IMAP. Um, again, to remind you, what we need to attack, the, um, to attack these passwords, we need multiple independent encryptions of the password. And we need the password to be encrypted at a favorable position. Because if you go back here, you see these are nice biases, right? So this gives us a good success rate. And actually anywhere along here in the first 256 positions, you're kind of in the money if, if your password is encrypted there. Right. So um, what we did is we set up 
we set up an iChair server and we set up a Chrome client in a virtual network. And in basic auth, uh, which was defined as part of the HTTP 1 standard, it was defined to protect access to web pages and protected resources. What happens is, is that once a user has logged in, that password will be attached to each and every single subsequent GET request. So what I needed was I needed a mechanism to be able to send a number of GET requests from my client to my server once the user had logged in. Right? So this is from iChair, uh, this is from Chrome to my iChair server. So in order to do that, this is, an, this is one of the techniques we kind of borrow from Beast, is we got Alice, the client, to um, connect to evil.com, a malicious web server, and she downloaded some JavaScript into her browser. Right? And this JavaScript was responsible for repeatedly sending GET requests. Now, because of the same origin policy, the JavaScript could not directly access the password. But because of something called cross-origin resource sharing, the JavaScript can send GET requests to a server, to a server from which it didn't originate. So that's how we sent our GET requests with our password now attached, and of course it's all encrypted. But remember, I needed my, my ciphertext to be encrypted with independent RC4 keys. So what that means is I need a man in the middle that can effectively break the connection to force the use of a fresh key and to collect my ciphertext. Now in our setup on a virtual network, I was running a host-only network on a laptop, um, I, could, I could send GET requests every 80 milliseconds. But out there in the wild, a TLS connection will take between 500 and 1,000 milliseconds, right? And if you think about, if you can get resumption to happen, and in a lot of cases, resumption is enabled all the time, so if, if a connection can resume, it will, you can maybe reduce that to about half the time to 250 milliseconds. So if you can send GET requests every 250 milliseconds, and you're able to open parallel connections, this is also a possibility, um, Browsers like Chrome and Firefox allow you to open six parallel connections. Then to collect two to the 26 ciphertexts, where we do reasonably well with our attack, if you remember from the graph, uh, it will take you about seven, or just under 800 hours. If you assume a reduced latency, maybe because of proximity to the server um, of 100 milliseconds, you can get this down to just over 300 hours. Now this is significantly better than those 2,000 hours that the attacks by AlphaDon et al needed. So we definitely were getting closer to getting attacks that were far more practical. Okay, um, so the RC4 story kind of has a happy ending. Uh, well, by the time I presented this at Usenix uh, last year, RC4 had reduced, the use of RC4 had reduced to about 12.8%. And it's reduced even further still today to about 2.4%. So that's good. Um, it's good that people are not using RC4 anymore. And hopefully, you know, the work that we've done has helped to contribute to the state of affairs. All right, so that was my zoom in, and now I'm gonna zoom back out again so you can relax. There's, there's no more uh, stats for a while. Um, mm -hmm. and so um, we get back to our timeline, and of course there were attacks that came after ours. There was the freak attack, uh, and the freak attack allowed for the downgrading to 512-bit export crypto, particularly for RSA keys, which could you know, be factored. Then you get the bar mitzvah attack uh, by Manton. This was another attack against RC4, but it used a different weakness, a, kind of a different bias. It used what's known as the invariance weakness, which creates an L-shaped pattern in some keys. Then there was logjam, again, downgrading to 512-bit export crypto, uh, but this, this time now for Diffie-Hellman. And then the, they also explain in the paper nice ways of 512-bit Diffie-Hellman, how you could kind of um, find the discrete logs. And then there was more RC4 work uh, by Van Hoof and Piesens, and this was at Usenix last year. And I think they also looked at WPA, but they, also, they did TLS too, and um, they used a different set of biases to start attacking cookies in TLS. Then, of course, later you'll hear about the, oh, sorry, you'll hear about the attacks by Tebow and colleagues. And then there's Sloth, um, which came, I think, early this year, or was it towards the end of last year? Um, you know, kind of exploiting the use of bad hash functions in TLS. And then there's the drown attack, which you'll hear about a bit later. So our attack timeline now looks like this. And uh, it's quite a lot of red uh, on that attack timeline. Um, 
you can also see a TL is 1.3 point over there. So this was um, this was draft 10 of TL is 1.3 had been released in October, and this is when I started looking at TL is 1.3. But I'll say more about that a bit later on. Okay, um, I've been a bit cheeky by saying that I'm going to talk about the future of TLS in this talk. Uh, what I really want to say is, see my next talk, um, <laughs> I'll say a little bit now about TLS 1.3. So the first draft of TLS 1.3 was released in March um, of 2015, and then almost a year later, we're now at draft 12, right? So there have been a number of drafts, and it's the drafts are, some of them are radically different as well. Um, so TLS 1.3 is really the IETF's answer to kind of all of this that you see over there and also the need to improve efficiency of the protocol to make it faster. And there were a few new design goals. Uh, they wanted to encrypt as much of the handshake as possible, to reevaluate the handshake contents. So there are a different set of handshakes now in TLS 1.3. Uh, renegotiation has been removed uh, and resumption is now done slightly differently. Uh, uh, we can now use a single round trip before we can start um, exchanging application data in the initial handshake, whereas in TLS 1.2, you needed two round trips to be able to do this. There's also now this um, early data functionality, so the client can send data on its first flight. This is what we call zero RTT. Uh, there's also something come that's come along, it's called 0 0.5 RTT, and that's really early data for the server. That's the server responding to the client's early data. There's also been an update to the record protection mechanisms as well. All right, so to kind of conclude, I'm just going to leave you with uh, this attack timeline that is quite clearly washed in red. Um, and you, it really just is to show you the evidence of this explosion of attacks against TLS. Um, so a lot is going on with TLS, TLS 1.3. It's been an exciting development process. Um, we don't really know what it's, the final is going to look like. Hopefully, there'll be a draft soon. Um, so with regards to the future of TLS, hopefully, it isn't going to look as colorful as the past. Okay, Thank you. <laughs>